Welcome. We've been solving lots of different integrals and, and seeing different techniques, so today I thought I'd show you how to use i, that's the imaginary number, in order to evaluate some different integrals. Now, as you recall, uh, the square root of negative 1, that's what we're going to call i, and we can really use it in some interesting situations to break up things like x squared plus 1 into something like x plus i and x minus i. But enough talking, let's go ahead and look at the example I have in mind and how we're going to use our imaginary number to go ahead and run through the integration process. We're going to do the integral of 1 to infinity of 1 over x multiplied by x squared plus 1. So that x and x squared plus 1, all of that is in the denominator. And we're going to go through a technique of partial fraction decomposition. Uh, the idea with this is we're going to break up our fraction into lots of smaller fractions. Now here's where I can take care or take advantage of the imaginary number i here. This, if I want to factor it into some linear factors, this would factor into x plus i and x minus i. Now I'm really aiming for linear factors because this will make my partial fraction decomposition a little bit nicer. So I'll have a over x plus b over its linear term, x plus i, plus c over x minus i, dx. All right, so that all looks pretty good. Since these are all linear terms in the bottom, I just have regular coefficients in the top like a, b, and c. Where we go from here is we want to determine what these coefficients are. You know, are they negative one, are they five? You know, what are they? So imagine taking our um, numerator there and we'll multiply it by the denominators that it's missing. So a will get multiplied by an x plus i and an x minus i. The b, that'll get multiplied by an x and an x minus i. And c over there, we should multiply that one by x and x plus i. And of course, these represent all of our numerators when we put them together, so we need them to equal our original numerator. All right, so we're going to use this and kind of manipulate it a little bit. Hopefully we can figure out what these equal to in the end uh, as soon as we develop a system of equations. Uh, so let's see, we'll put this back together. This will be x squared plus 1. And let's go ahead and distribute this through. So this will be bx squared minus a bxi plus a cx squared plus a cxi. Again, all of that is still equal to 1. Uh, let's see, just a little bit more distributing here. So I have an ax squared plus an a. And then I think everything else is exactly the same. So we won't touch that just for now, but we will get to it as we start making some different comparisons to see what values we'd get for our a, b, and c. All right, let's get a little bit of room. Now, the big part is remembering that the left side is equal to the right side. So what we're going to do is we're going to collect together all of our terms that involve this x squared. Let's see, we got three of them. We have ax squared, bx squared, and cx squared. So this is another way of saying that a plus b plus c, all of those are associated with x squared. It's like I grouped them all together and then factored it out. Uh, let's see, other things. Looks like we have some xi terms. So we could combine those together. This would give us a negative b plus a c. Those are associated with xi. Um, and it looks like the last term we have here on the left side is just an a. So we can say plus a. All of that is still equal to 1. And now we can make some really good comparisons. So looking at the left side, we see an x squared. On the right side, there is no x squared, which means all of these terms, the a, b, and c, all of those must combine and give us a value of 0. That would be the only way that we could essentially get rid of the x squared and it would equal the right side. Same thing's happening with this negative b and c. They're associated with an xi, but there is no xi on the right, so negative b plus c, that must equal 0. All right, and let's see. a is just some number. It's not associated with any x's, so that will equal our constant on the other side. a is equal to 1. So we have a system of three equations and three unknowns, 
Uh, though it looks like we already know one of these, we already know that a is equal to 1. So we're just going to solve this for the rest of the coefficients. Uh, since we know the value of a, let's go ahead and put that into equation number 1. So I'm looking at b plus c is equal to 0, uh, and I can move that 1 to the other side. So I get b plus c is equal to negative 1. So this e equation involves b and c, but so does this equation. Let's go ahead and put those two equations together and see if we can figure out more about b and c. So I've written them next to each other. I've done that because it looks like the b's can be combined and canceled out. So adding those would be 0, those would be 2c, and this is just a negative 1. Solving for c, we have c that equals to negative 1 half. So now I have a value for a, I have a value for c, and we're almost home free. Let's see what else we can do. Uh, well, this equation involves b and c, so maybe I'll take my negative 1 half and I'll put it into there. So b plus a negative 1 half equals negative 1. Well, that's great. That means I can add a 1 half to both sides. Negative 1 plus a 1 half is still a negative 1 half. And so now I have the value of a, b, and c. Perfect. All right, so if you recall, the reason why we're solving for a, b, and c is was in this partial fraction decomposition. We're taking our integral, breaking it into these littler fractions, and a, b, and c represent these numerators in the fractions. So a had a value of 1, b had a value of negative 1 half, and c also had a value of negative 1 half. All right, so now I just need to figure out the value of this integral. Since they're all uh, added or subtracted, I can take the antiderivative of each of these one by one. So taking the antiderivative of 1 over x, uh, that'll just give us a natural log of x. This negative 1 half is a constant, so I could really move it out in front. Now here's the interesting part. You know, you might be worried what to do with that antiderivative of i, but it is a number just like the number 5 or the number 6, so it's not really going to affect uh, taking that antiderivative. No problems there. So we'll just deal with the natural log of x plus i. See, no problems, nothing to worry about. Uh, and the last one, see, it also has a negative 1 half that can come out front. We won't worry about that. Antiderivative x minus i. And we need some bounds on this. We are still evaluating this from 1 to infinity. All right, so it's looking better. Now we just have to maybe combine a lot of these natural logs together so we can move on to actually finding that limit. Let's see what we can do. Uh, so nothing I really want to do with that natural log of x just yet. Both of these involve a negative 1 half, so maybe we'll factor that. And then we'll have a natural log of x plus i plus a natural log of x plus i. Uh, our rules for logarithms is that if we have two logarithms added together, the insides will multiply. So we can go ahead and combine those. Okay, that's looking fantastic. Uh, we've already seen how that will combine back into an x squared uh, plus 1. So let's go ahead and do just that. So natural log of x squared plus 1. Okay, that's looking excellent. Again, we want to get these two natural logs together, uh, but I can't do it just yet. Uh, we need to go ahead and maybe put this negative 1 half on the inside. All right, let's get a little bit of room and do just that. So let's take that negative 1 half. And since it is a negative, I could write the inside as a fraction. Uh, one half power would give me a square root. So this is like the square root of x squared plus 1. And 1 on top. Still evaluating this from 1 to infinity. All right, now I have a natural log of x plus a natural log of all of this. Uh, rules of logarithm says I can put these together into one giant logarithm. No problem. I'll just have an x all divided by the square root of x squared plus 1. All right, I think we're finally ready to take on some limits. Uh, so we'll take care of the top bound and the bottom bound. Let's see what that gives us. So for the top, I'm looking at the limit as x goes to infinity of the natural log of x over the square root of x squared plus 1. All that's underneath the square root. Minus. And this one's just a nice solid number, so we can just plug in 1. Square root of 1 squared plus 1. All right, let's see what that gives us. So as x goes towards infinity, 
uh, natural log is a continuous function, so we can move that inside of the natural log. And then I'm really just looking at the limit of this. Uh, using something like L'Hopital's, we'll get that the top and bottom are essentially growing at the same rate. We can tell because of the square root and the x squared. So the inside here, evaluating that limit, it just goes to 1. So natural log of 1. Uh, here, let's see, I'll get a minus natural log of 1 over the square root of 2. All right, this thing is, you know, almost there. Natural log of 1, there's a nice value. That just goes to 0. Uh, so really what I have here is a negative natural log of 1 over the square root of 2. Uh, and of course, we can simplify that, simplify that even farther. If I want, I can move that negative sign inside there. And anything with a negative exponent will actually just flip my fraction over. So this turns into the natural log of the square root of 2. And uh, I could leave that as my answer. Uh, or, you know, if, as long as I'm playing around with these different uh, um, powers and my natural log, this is the same as the natural log of 2 to the 1 half or 1 half natural log of 2. All of these answers are really the same. It just depends on how you want to write it or how you want your answer to look. So, and there we go. This actually is the value of that original integral. Some interesting things to take away from this. We use that i to better help with our partial fraction decomposition, but i really didn't play a, a big role in our integration since we treated it like a regular number. Other great things to look at is notice how our answer is a nice real number. It doesn't have any imaginary parts whatsoever. All right, so hopefully you really like that trick. Uh, if you'd like to see some of my other different techniques for integration, definitely check out my other videos over at mysecretmathtutor.com.